Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hordup with Killing Kryptonite, Our Potential. You know, uh, I love the fact that we can come before God and uh, sing His praises. You know, sing powerful songs like Revelation song, where we're made very aware of God's holiness of how pure he is, how righteous he is. And that, that holiness of God is not a holiness that, um, that is intended to drive us away. It's a holiness that is filled with, with his love and his mercy and his grace. And as we're overwhelmed with that holiness, if we come before him with with this heart that is surrendered, we find that he embraces us. We find that he that it is because of the cross of Christ we can we can experience and know forgiveness of sin. The holiness of God invites us into his presence, right? And the love of Jesus becomes very oh, uh, real and alive to us because it is. When God's people pray and they seek to get God's glory, God's love and good nature is made known in remarkable ways. And, and I'm not one, I mean, God doesn't fix football games, right? I know that because I'm a Lions fan. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when God's people pray, and they believe scripture. And they believe that God has called them to be a light in a dark world. God raises up people in, in, in unexpected times to bring truth to his name. I watched the end, I watched the, watched the game last week, and it, it came to the end of the game, and I usually don't watch the trophy presentation. There's usually the team I pick loses. But I, I picked the right one this year. But I watched a little bit of that, and I watched the first three players get up there. And all three of them said, I want to give glory to God and my Savior, beginning with the coach. I thought, what's happening here, right? Is Billy Graham going to come out next? <laughs> and it was authentic. And it wasn't, it wasn't this, God help me win this game. It wasn't about that. It was, it was if you look and listen to what these what these men have been saying consistently this year. It is about their faith in, in them. And they believe that God has given them a platform that they are called to be responsible with, to be witnesses. And I thought that's the same for, for all of us should have that attitude. It doesn't matter if we're sweeping floors for an employer. God gives us these assignments in life to be a witness for him. No matter what that is. And he gives us a platform to make his love known in this dark world that is in need of knowing his love. And I know when God's people pray and when they seek to give God's glory, God is able to move within his people with this awesome power. God chooses to use followers of Christ in every walk of life to make his light known. He just does. But I also know this, is too often followers of Christ, too often the church is not, is not being the light or not shining as bright as it could or as it should. We're getting this series over the next few weeks called Killing Crypt Tonight. It's a book by John Bevere, and, and, um, and he, in his book he talks about what kryptonite is. We all know about Superman, right? He's not real, but we know about the story. Now Superman is, is uh, because he's from another world, he's able to come to this planet and he has all this superhuman strength and is able to do all these superhuman things. But Superman has, there is this one thing that can take Superman's strength and it's called kryptonite. And Superman doesn't usually know that kryptonite's in the area, but he, but he finds himself becoming weaker. 
That, that is the one thing that takes his strength, that takes his power from him, his kryptonite. And if he's exposed to it too long, it takes so much strength that he'll become even weaker than, than the next human being. It will take all of his power. Now that's a fictitious thing. But there is kryptonite, a spiritual kryptonite that takes hold in our life. We're going to uncover what that is, but it's always wrapped up in, in various kinds of sin. And many times it takes hold when we're not even aware it's taking hold in our life. You know, I, I think about uh, you know about things that happen that we see happen, and uh, you know, we, we think about the testimony we just witnessed in their polls. But I think about other things, like when I read in the Book of Acts about the early church, and I and I and I read how the early church gathers and they pray, and the Bible will say things like, "And the place was shaken." The Bible never exaggerates. Or I think about um, things I read from some of the churches um, that we partner with. Sometimes it's an update from Pastor Rodney. And I think about how God uses them to do these incredible things. And, and, uh, and it's only through the power of God. And I've been reminded that God is not limited by what we think he's limited by. You know? God's not limited by resources. Sometimes we think if only I had, you know, the apocalypse, if only I had this thing or this ability, then God could use me. No, God doesn't need any of that. He just needs us to seek him and to allow ourselves to be filled by his presence. I, uh, I wonder sometimes, church, if, um, if maybe followers of Christ are living the local potential God has called us to. I mean, shouldn't there be this huge difference between a follower of Christ and someone who doesn't know Christ? I mean, not a difference where, where the Christian walks around and says, see, my life is this way because I follow Christ. No, but it's just a difference and how we live, the choices we make. <laughs> shouldn't, there, shouldn't it be easy to recognize the follower of Christ because of the fruit? But increasingly, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to pick among the crowd. Shouldn't the evidence of the Holy Spirit be, be evident in our life where it's normal? I was talking with Larry Ann the other day, last last week, and, uh, and I don't know, I, I was, for some reason, I was remembering, remembering uh, things from way early in our ministry. And I was remembering before, before either one of our boys were born, we were working in, we, we were living in, in the, in the thumb, and, and uh, working with the youth group. And Larry Ann had, had uh, taken all their kids and assigned prayer partners to them. And we had, I mean, we were, we were young, so we were kind of dumb, okay? We were, I don't think I was old enough to drink yet. So I was like 20, I think we were still 20, maybe 21, maybe. It wasn't more than 21. And um, so anyway, this, one of the, one of the, the girls in the group that we were working with was having some real problems in her walk. And, and we, we really felt they were spiritual problems and she needed to be prayed for. Well, her prayer partner was this, this lady when you're 21. This lady was in her 70s, so that's really old to you, to us when you're 21. Now that I'm 50, I think it's even quite so old. <laughs> but we got word that this girl was struggling and we, we said, we, we were, we, we said we need to pray for her. And we need to have her prayer partner pray with her. And this was, it was after 10 o'clock at night. It was probably 10.30. 
But we, we, were, we, we didn't know decorum yet. We called this lady up. And we woke her up. We said, we got to pray for this young lady. This is going on. We got to pray for her. And you know what happened that night? That lady opened her home. And several of us went to her home. And we prayed and we interceded for that young lady. And I say we were young and dumb, but you know what? That's what the church is supposed to do. That's, that's how, um, that's being obedient to the power of God. And there is the, there is this substance in, that's very real in the church today, that's very real in the power of Christ today, that is sucking the power, the spiritual power that we should have from us. And over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to dive into what that might be and what that is. 1 John uh, 1, 7 and 1 John 2, 6. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. If you spend some time, I mean, spend some time this week and, and read John's letters. They're short. But it'll take you a while to read through them and to pray through them because John makes it very, very clear that God calls us to live in this right, saving, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but, but that relationship cannot be hindered by sin. John, John says things that says, you know, if we claim we live without sin, then we lie. We deceive ourselves. He says things like, if we claim to follow Christ, but we hate our brother, we're lying. And he makes it very, very clear that the only way we can deal with sin is with the cross of Christ by surrendering to him. And then walking as Jesus walked, not living. I mean, we're not supposed to say, well, First John says that we've all sinned, so I'm just going to sin and say there's a cross. No. He says, surrender our life to Christ and walk as Jesus did. Walk in this bright, saving, continual relationship with him. Walk as he walked. What would happen, church? What would happen if we really listened to what Scripture tells us? What would happen? Would we embrace? Um, would, what would happen if we embrace these verses? Would would my witness be stronger? Would my choices be different? Would God's power be more evident in my life? So I've was thinking about these things, and I was thinking about some passages in Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, go to the Gospel of Luke. And, and I just I just want to walk through a couple things in this in this chapter because um, I want to think of ask you to think about it maybe in a way you haven't thought about it before. First of all, chapter 14, beginning of verse 15. Jesus talks about this great mind He says, when one of those at the table with the purpose, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And remember, Jesus is teaching, this is during Jesus' um, final months here on this earth. It's during the last year, last uh, portion of his ministry before he'll be arrested and be crucified for his sins. And Jesus says, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported all this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants go out and put gold quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor people, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So the servant said, What you have ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to his servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them and bring them in. So that my house will be full, I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will taste of my banquet. Jesus gives us a picture 
I mean, he calls us to be a follower of Christ. And, and Jesus talks about the kingdom of God in several passages. And the kingdom of God is certainly something we look forward to, right? We look forward to one day being in heaven and being with him. But the kingdom of God is also something we're part of now. If you are a follower of Christ, you're part of the kingdom of God. But this call goes out sometimes. We have this invitation to live in this fellowship with Christ. And we make excuses. I can't come today, Lord. I have this thing going on. It's just hard sometimes. So we, we identify really what these people were saying. Oh, I don't have time for your banquet because this thing in my life is more important. Do we ever say in our life, God, I don't have time for you this because I want to do it on my own. Jesus goes from there and he begins to talk about the cost of being a disciple. And he says in verse 25, it says this, this large crowds were crowding with Jesus and turning to and then he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And Jesus says these hard words and we say, man, that, that's, that's harsh, Lord. But what Jesus is saying, look, if you love anything more than me, if anything is even close to your love for me, you can't be my disciple. You will fail and serve me. You will serve that thing instead. See, our love for Christ needs to be way up here. And the closer I am to Christ, the better husband I am, the better father I am. The closer we are to Christ, the better, the better person will be at work. The better person will be in our community. So my love for Christ needs to be so much so that, that even my love for my wife, that is, that I love, I'm sorry, I love her more than anyone in this room. You know, if this room's on fire, she gets saved first. <laughs> but my love for her, it, it can't be, it can't be close where it becomes greater than my love for Christ. If it does, I will fail her. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to love him this way. You have to love me where, where it's above all. So then, he, then he goes on and he explains, there's a cost. Jesus never presents the gospel without talking about the fact that there's a cost. But there's a cost. People will hate you. People will come against you. People will misunderstand you. We see in our culture more and more as we follow Christ, people will say, how can you believe this thing? Whatever it is, is simple. How can you believe that, that some people will go to hell? How can you love a God like that, right? And they will ridicule you. And they will say things about you that aren't true. But, nonetheless, we must continue to show the way of Christ. Jesus then talks about, later on in John 15, he Luke paints us this picture of Jesus that is a loving and a forgiving and a merciful God. And the most um, familiar of the passages is the father who had two sons, right? And you, you can read that this week, but the father had these two sons. Remember the younger son said, I want to do it for myself now. I want to do my own thing. I want to do it my way. And so he actually had the audacity to go to his dad and said, I want my inheritance now before you die. In fact, he was saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I had your money, but you're not, so give it to me now. What a selfish thing to do, right? And he took the money, he squandered it, did his own thing, his own way, he squandered it, blew it off, became in need, became a wreck, he was so hungry he was longing to eat when he was feeding pigs. He was completely powerless. When he was with his father, and in his father's house, he was an heir to all this fortune. He had the power as an heir along with his father in that right relationship. And, he, and he, he turned his back on that and went his own way and eventually became completely powerless and at the bottom. Eventually he comes home and says, I, you know, I can just go home and be a servant and serve. I'll be much better off. But he comes home and his father forgives him and he restores him and he has 
the fatty calf home and restores him completely into the family, which means he is now a rightful heir again. And the older becomes upset, becomes filled with bitterness, refuses to attend the party. And Jesus ends the story there, but now the older brother, we see him missing out on being part of this family, this celebration of knowing this love, of knowing what it is to be in the midst of all this. And his, his joy is being taken away by his bitterness and by his sin. Both sons um, had their greatest potential when they were embraced by their father, when they, when they were loving their father and in that right relationship with him. You see, kryptonite is subtle. It's often something we justify. In the parable Jesus told, both sons made justification for their actions. They thought it was their right. But it's always rooted in sin. Kryptonite is always something where that takes the place of God, which makes it an idol. And it will take our strength. It will, it will destroy our ability to act in the power of God. So I want to ask as we begin this series, I just want to ask you to, to, uh, to reflect on some scripture with me. And I want to ask you to pray and to, to ask God to, to be willing to say, God, I'm willing to, to not be comfortable as we go through this. Lord, I'm willing to let you uh, do a work in my life, even if it's hard. And Lord, I'm asking that you would show me things that, that are not of you that are taking my strength. And as we pray those things, I am praying that all of us, myself included, will be willing to surrender these things to Christ completely. See, there's a, I, you've probably heard me say, you may remember I talked about um, uh, the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. Sometimes people will, have, uh, will ask me um, what scripture I can use to help me deal with the temptation. And I, and I will sometimes remind them, well, think of this. Think of being a G5 follower of Christ or a G5 Christian. What's a G5 Christian? A G5 Christian is one who, who is reading and reflecting on this passage and is praying this for their life. In this passage, the Apostle Paul says this. He starts off in verse 16 of Galatians 5. He says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit was contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other. So that you, so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul says, he says, I'm calling you and I'm reminding you we should live by the Spirit. He says, and there's a sin, sinful nature. And, and I would dare say all of us in this room know what the sin nature is. We understand it. But just in case we don't, the Apostle Paul tells us. He says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that, the, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, friends, those simple desires, do they just, we just don't wake up one day and say, I think today I will embrace harsh conflict that is not of God. I think I will do that today. It's not how it happens. But today I think I will enter into debauchery and gross sexual immorality. I'm just going to do that today. It doesn't happen that way. It takes place over a period of time eroding away at us. When we think we are, are righteous and we deserve that. Maybe someone wrongs us in a small way and we think, I deserve it. A bitter attitude toward them because. Or maybe we're frustrated. Like, I deserve to engage. 
I know this movie has things in it that they cause my thought life to be impure, but God understands he was my stress right now. Or maybe we think, you know, um, I really deserve to be selfish in this moment because of. Uh, or if I lie about this, it, it lets me get an extra hundred dollars, so God will understand that. See, the sexual the sexual sin, the 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 uh, the bitter sin, the anger sin, the rage sin, all those things, none of those things start off whole long, they start off small. And they work like a gripstone, and they begin to start their straight. But then Paul says this. He asks, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So Paul says, Look, this is about his relationship with God, the relationship with others. He says, let's, let's not provoke each other, but we're, we got to remember we're, we are part of the body of Christ. And he says, he says, he says the sinful nature and the fruits of the Spirit, they can't get along together. If you're struggling with the temptation over here, begin to pray the fruits of the Spirit. It will, it will diffuse that sinful nature. Make this a matter of prayer. So, so wherever you may be struggling, pray, pray that fruit of the Spirit. And meditate on those things and reflect on those things. And encourage one another in our, in our walk. That, that prayer partner you have that you trust the most. Have the courage to say, pray for me in this area. Hold me accountable in this area. Maybe it will mean that some of us need to wake someone up in the middle of the night. Right? Maybe that should become more normal. Man, I hope I don't get a bunch of phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> Father, as we go through this, as we look into your word, Lord, I'm convinced that you will take us through seasons where we're not comfortable. But Lord, you want to bring healing. You want to unleash your powers. Lord, help us to seek you. And then Lord, when we have to enter into seasons of confession and repentance, when we have to have a hard conversation to find help and accountability, Lord, as we seek to 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 pursue you with everything we have, Lord, I pray that the fruits of the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in us would be very, would be seen by our co-workers, by our family. I pray that they would see within us genuine love, that they would see peace, that they would see joy, Lord, that we would even have the courage to pay, to pray, that we would be patient and respond as you would have us respond. Lord, I pray that, that we would as we follow you and as we walk with you hand in hand, and we would truly be able to, to say, I am seeking to walk as Jesus walked and make your love and your life known. Lord, I pray that you would teach us and that you would walk with us throughout these next few weeks. And we will give you the glory.